Today on Time Out Coaching, we have one of the legends of British basketball coaching, a winner at every level he has coached, winner of 19 national titles and past head coach of both the England men's national team and the Great Britain wheelchair team. I'm pleased to welcome Coach Dave Titmus. Coach, good morning. Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, you know, we both know each other very well and you've done... I mean, your career is, you know, spans so, such a long time at the highest, highest levels. Um, and so, you know, want to try to do something slightly different today and talk, you know, a lot about, sure. you know, how, uh, you know, your philosophy and how it evolved and some of the things that conceptually that you were doing. Um, you know, so let's talk first about, you know, your early coaching philosophy um, and, and, and how did you come up with, you know, some of the things you, you taught, you, you taught at those times, especially, um, I'm thinking more about, you know, the read and react, you know, offense, the, the rules based motion offense. So where, where, where yeah. did you found, find that type of, uh, that system and that philosophy? Well, you know, it's interesting that I, cause obviously I was been looking back at things and, uh, uh, I mean, hell, I'm 75 now, so, so yeah, it's a time to review. But um, I think the, the philosophy really is like a tree, you know, it's the trunk of the tree. So the ba my basic tenants haven't changed, and I know how I arrived at them, which I'll tell you about. But it's just the methods. Obviously, the, you know, in when was it, 2000, when the, um, the three-point shot came in? Uh, that changed a lot of uh, approaches, I think. Um, and, and I noticed that, you know, last year in the NBA, uh, I think something like half the team shot 40% of their shots were from three. Oh and that was from like 17. So it, it obviously had a big, a big thing. But for me, um, I know exactly when it happened in the, in the early days of the club at Hemel, we had um, gone through regional leagues, and in those days, you had to qualify for the NBL, which is not a bad thing to have to do. You know, you had to have criteria, and, and you had to perform on the floor. There was an NIT tournament that we went to every year to try and get in. Anyway, we got in the league. We come from regional league, then we got into the league, and then we got promoted, and then we ended up with like a a full time uh, pro team. So. Uh, my feeling is that the, the key, the most important role of a coach is to maximize the potential the team he's got, you know, we, of the players he's got, we always, and that's what drove me in to create that, you know, to, to, to my search for an approach and, uh, and developing a philosophy. You see it in the BBL and the NBL this, this last season, I mean, we don't know the chemistries involved or really the skill levels of the players that, that coaches have got. But, you know, you get an idea and you think, well, you know, I've got, is he maximising uh, what he's got? But he, here's, the, here's the, the key thing for me. I, I had a team at Hemel. I had an NBA centre in Joe, Joe Pace. I had Larry Dassey at one, one for just a wonderful, wonderful man and a wonderful player and a, a, a dual national, Paul Stewart on the other wing. And when you looked at, and we had really good guards, you know, um, and we got to Wembley and lost at Wembley. And my, my feeling was that, you know, that, the, the, that team hadn't realized the potential of that team. Sure. And that really started me on, a, on, the, on the journey and trying to understand uh, you know what it what it was that that uh, how you maximise the potential you had and and the amazing thing to me is that I I I had the same fundamentals uh, and the same strategies and tactics and possibly environment as well as the other guy as the other coach so it's how do I use mine sure. uh, to to be him you know. But, um, or to beat that that team um, at, at this time, though, um, you know, as a, a youngest, a young coach in, in the UK, you know, w 
you were going, I'm assuming, to to America, and you were looking to America for concepts or you know like the things that you really gra- you know gravitate to so who were the who were the coaches that really inspired you um at that moment you know and that you said wow you know because i know myself obviously having the luck to be involved with yourself at your program and um you know meeting some of the great coaches in our country but you know when i watch rick patino it was a light yeah. it was a light bulb moment for me i was like i wanted to know how he taught that pressure defense Love, you know? yeah and i went there i actually went to his camp i worked his camp yeah. i saw the drills um and i was like this is what i'm taking back it's going to be part of my core philosophy and i know yeah. that you know must have you know happened somewhere along the line with yourself oh no question we were always in that era we were all looking west weren't we uh, sure. rather than to the the europe game uh, I heard Rick Pitino say once that all defense is ball defense, and that that really really stuck with me. You know, it's incredible. But in terms of of uh, thinking, my light bulb moment was um, I found some um, scruffy old clinic notes by Bob Knight, by Coach Knight at Indiana, and even got hold of some film of the early clips of of what they were doing and. It, it it seemed to me um it was it was mind-boggling for me because it seemed to me that offensively you've got a choice you know there's a continuum at one end you've got um strict patterns you know maybe continuities that sort of thing and at the other end you've got complete freelance you know and that somewhere in the middle i think are the rules based uh are rules based or action based um offenses so i i th- when i first looked at it i wanted to know um you know how how could i define it how could i see where and it just blew me you know the the his thought was um he he went off and to design his motion he called it motion I, you know it's a term a lot of people use but don't sure. really understand, understand it, I think. it no yeah I, I mean he he i know that he um uh, spent time with Pete Newell and they they wrote down all of the potential actions this is a good thing for you know we could all do this today sure, yeah. uh, wrote down all of the potential offensive actions um and and also maybe how how they would be guarded so you know, you got a double stagger away or something and and what you could do with the ball or without the ball after you pass the ball what could you do there were seven things i think that he came out with so he put all these things together and here and here's the big idea he he and i can't intellectually i can't get past this you know he um he he said right well if if the defense does this then the offense must counter so um you know the great thing i i i like was it was the idea that you know the defense plays above you then you're going to back cut it plays below you you know you're gonna you're gonna face cut if if you screen if there's a screen somewhere that guy with the ball uh, that guy without the ball coming off the screen has got to be able to read and counter what the defense is doing if he's above it in back cut and so on there's no way uh, you know, in some of these modern sort of pattern or some pattern type offenses, as opposed to actions, that um, you know you can run a back cut and still continue the the continuity or or still continue your offense, and that's the test. Yeah, for me, that's the test. Can you have you know create a screen situation where if the guy reads and makes a back cut or whatever, or come, can you still run? Uh, what you're doing yeah, you see what balance. i mean what so that um, central idea really really got me going. i get a bit enthusiastic no no no, no. <laughs> um at that time am i um right in thinking that his motion based motion based principles were three out two in or were they four out one one in i i um was he script was he always believing there should be someone in the post and whatever whenever that post was screened out you know someone should be in or was it or was it but was there the two the two the two bigs work together 
Now, I mean, this was the fascination for me. He had seven alignments, seven different alignments with their own rules. Um, uh, the most successful from, from my point of view as a coach was the was the sort of um, high a high offense, you know. But no, he would have a single post four out. He would have three guys. His idea was that two guys in the post working together um, was much easier to guard than three guys sure. in the post. So you see, he'd have three in, two out. Right. And then the guards would, you know, the defense would help off the guards, so the guards were open. And so on. And those seven, those seven alignments, by a simple, they had their own rules, very similar. You know, sure. somebody below you, you screen, and so on. But they, were, the amazing thing about it was that you, in one possession, you could be running three out, two in, and then the next possession, you'd be five out or right. five highs. It was the way he called it. You know, sure. is what what he did. So. In, you're always unpredictable to the defense and within that system you one of the criticisms is that you know anybody gets a shot that's not true you you can absolutely say fred's going to get the shot and he's going to get it from here and everybody on the team knows it yeah so eventually came up with a definition and this is what's carried me through that um but basically um that offense was five is five people working together to get a shot they can make. Uh, I was talking to um, uh, a co coaching friend a little while ago, and he was talking about the a shot they can make bit. Right. He said that that's the bit in the in modern offense. He thinks, particularly in this country, that we're most poor at. In other words, you've got to have an offense that accommodates the kid or the guy that can create off his um you know can create his own shot uh, but you've also got to accommodate other other guys you know the the other guys who maybe need to get separation maybe need a screen or they they need a, somebody to cut so that, you know creates help that you can you can uh, uh, flare out i mean it's it, it's magic <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> there are no magic you. systems but no. but to me it is you know how um i've got a question i'm going to talk about the game in towards the towards the end and we'll discuss that in detail because i'm sure you've got a lot of thoughts on that uh, about how the game has been played at the highest levels now um, yeah yeah how did you this this so that how, you you've you've taken you've seen it it's almost a light bulb moment how yeah. did you bring it into your own philosophy and and, and specifically um you with certain teams so obviously your 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 successful hemel teams and then um you know with the junior programs and stuff how did you start incorporating those you know this this system and building it into your own kind of dna um did you change well, it radically or did you because obviously um you know here in the uk we didn't have as as much of the obviously raw talent that would have been available to coach knight and stuff so did, no, you simplify, no, no. did you simplify some of the rules and and or did you did you you know just take a couple of the actual alignments and just go with oh, that? that yeah oh that's that's really interesting tony i think i think that um I think the biggest failings of some of those early, early days, uh, when I think about it and, put, and putting it, was this idea of looking and seeing. And I, I did a clinic a little while ago on this about, and this was Knight's. I can best describe this with, with what Knight said about passing. You, um, I, I'll come back to your point because this is pertinent to it. That you, you, uh, you know, I'm in the blue team and I, I've got somebody on my team who's in the blue, who's, who's wearing blue. I've got a red defender and a red defender on him. And, you know, the, the approach was simple that most players, and you saw it all the time, certainly with the junior national teams I coached, young guys, you know, talented physically and so on, who they would look at the blue vest and, and make a pass to the, to the blue vest. It, instead of reading the red vest and saying, well, where was the red vest? You know, we, we coaches talk about pass away from defense, all of that stuff, but it's not the same as saying, well, well, look at, look at that. So 
to answer the question, I think I, I think what I did was run very simple, well, simple on one level, but sure. I guess complex on another, yeah. breakdown drills. I, and I thought that was the, the way, you know, I mean, I'm not so sure about that now, but the breakdown drills where, uh, you know, guys were encouraged to, to read. In, in other words, every drill always had a defensive and offensive connotation. Mm, so you, you you know dry running stuff no you, you can't read if you don't have defense right you, you see what i mean yes for sure absolutely yeah so i and that led to other other things but i think that that's how i did it but listen i i, I there were there were problems with that you know there, there's no question about it you know teams were still running content even with the shot clock you know i you know i can remember some of those teams were going up against running what was it flex and and uh, you know all these these different um, shuffle stagger yeah shuffle yeah the, the famous shuffle stuff and 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 so on um, and you always ended up deep in the shot clock with nowhere to go you know? yeah it's fun, <laughs> you know, it's, fun, it's it's funny you know and we just laugh about that because I have had this discussion just recently about shuffle stagger and you know I'd be for me because you know, I loved it I saw it you know first specifically by Lino Frattini who, who coached at London Towers and you know I took it lock stock and barrel but I always thought well if the guy shuffles off and you've got this guy in the post just give him the goddamn ball but oh. everyone wants to <laughs> everyone wants to run all of these staggers just because it was the case of running them it was like so funny to see it and like you said I used to, as a coach, um, you know, coaching in, in, in the BBL mostly, you know, I used to tell our team, don't blow up the play. Let them run the play because they'll get to the end of the second shuffle, uh, sorry, second second set of stagger cuts, and they, they'll they oh, be down for like three or four seconds. They're going to be heaving the ball up. So that's yeah, so, interesting. Yeah. So funny. So funny. Yeah. It's, it's uh, funny from there. Um, so moving slightly on. Um, just talking about, you know, that coaching influence, um, Coach Knight, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I we'll talk uh, about the, the defensive stuff, but was there any any other coach that, you know, other or other coaches that you were taking inspiration for at, that, at the start of your career? What, who Name some of these others that you looked at, and I, I know for sure that you really went uh, and, and studied Hubie Brown, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, I mean, I know it's a hypocritical story now, but, uh, you know, the famous got on the plane, went over to um, New York, met him at the Palisades and uh, had a personal clinic. It was he was wonderful. Actually, he was fantastic. And that actually um, was, was on a on a defensive uh, uh, mission uh, because, um, he, you know, he, he had different keys for changing defense. And I came up with, well, I, I think, that, to me, defense is one guy guarding the ball and four people helping. However, whatever system, whatever, however you play, you know, pressure on the ball is non-negotiable and four people helping. But certainly Hubie Brown in that, in that uh, clinic, sitting in his flat in New York, you know, glass of wine, it, it was. And then I got on a plane and came back the next day. Um, it was also... The first time I really thought about the trap because he was really into that at that at that time. But and the, the a there was the physical execution of the trap, but also what the other three guys did. You know how you could you could take the parallel away, take the down pass away, take the middle of the floor, but you couldn't guard the backside sort of thing. Right. Uh, and, and so there you could adjust it, make it soft. Anyway, all those 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 uh, sort of things. But he was. But the other guy, and you'll identify with this because of, um, uh, you know, your thoughts about athleticism and pressure and so on, was, of course, Tarkanian at UNLV. Oh, yeah. I had, a, and Bud Presley was there, and Tim Gergovich, who's, who's uh, an outstanding individual development player in the NBA, uh, coach in the NBA. I think he's still in the NBA. Yeah. Uh, but Tarkanian... Um, was was into movement fundamentals, which I would not really thought about, and how you maximise that, and how you control the other team with defence, uh, and control was the big word, you know, was was uh, not allowing teams to do what they wanted to do 
with this incredible pressure. Yeah. Quick story, for, I'm at the Thomas and Mack Centre, get off the plane, go to the Thomas and Mack Centre, um, where, where they were playing, it had, it had fairly recently opened actually, but I go there and I'm sitting up in the stands, you know, is this kid, this guy from England, um, and I'm watching practice and, and they roll the balls out. They don't roll the balls out, I beg your pardon. They don't roll the balls out for the first hour, hour and a quarter of the practice. It's all movement fundamentals. And when, you, when, those, you say, when you say movement fundamentals, are you saying that there's probably early strength and conditioning guys running just just athletic drills there, you know, sprinting, change of direction, jumping, that type of stuff? Yeah, there was that, but there's also situational. So wow. I'm guarding the wing. I'm, I'm showing baseline, but foot placement, hand placement, um, but without without somebody being there other than the coach, the coach would be on the side with the ball. You'd sprint, you'd close out, not fly by close outs. No, 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 no. <laughs> not no. in not in those days, but no. um, but it was incredible. And the and the um, you know the instead of step slide, it was pull push, yeah, pull push with the yeah. with the footwork, all of that, all all of that everything that made you quicker. And anticipation drills as well, which which somehow made them look quicker than they. They were great athletes because yeah. he recruited to that. Yeah, he was able to recruit to that, you know. But my God, everybody talks about the running rebels and their break and the score. But that, that's the foundation was what he was doing then. Oh. Uh, and of course, I came back to England full of it. So, <laughs> you know, I really thought, hey. That, that that's what you do and then suddenly you find a slow kid that can't yeah. move his feet <laughs> yeah. and um yeah you, you you have to find a different approach so so, so yeah sorry uh, tuck canyon was, was uh actually bob presley who was wonderful to me he was at menlo state an old guy real old pro you know used to practice with ice bags on his knees he was about 500 years old uh he was wonderful absolutely wonderful so talking a little bit about the Hubie Brown influence and and, yeah. and Tarkanian, you know, I mean, one thing that most uh, a lot of people know about you is, you know, is is your attention to detail at the defensive yeah. end. Um, yeah. Talk about your your man to man, you know, basic philosophy, um, how that changed, and then also, like you said, about this, you know, change in defenses because that was something you know that you you did a lot of in in, in your career. Yeah, I, I did, and that, I mean that's that's. Um, did you take? Um, did you take I, the? Did you take? Were you were you mainly Bobby Knight? You know, basic principles like we all were back. You know, right back then yeah. originally. You know, um, you know um, how how you diagonal. guarded help side, yeah. and, and and every every defense was a combination. Of, every man defense was a combination of zone principles. Uh, and man and um, so on. But I think um, I had some success with, with changing defenses. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I, I think it go, looking back, I think it was stuff I'd seen from UNC, you know, with uh, what, and what he did. He was famous for that, wasn't Dean he? Smith, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dean Smith. Um, and the interesting thing was that, that what I found was that even at the higher levels, uh, and, and Nick Nurse has used zone coverage, you know, in the in the in the yeah. NBA. Absolutely. I know they've got the three second uh, defensive three second rule, but anyway, um, I, and what I found was that almost change for change's sake. I could never play a pure zone. I never played a pure zone. I wanted hybrids sure. of some for some form or another and what the one big thing it, it seemed to do was to knock the other team off balance but particularly these real pattern orientated teams and and create like an assist mentality in their in their players they all wanted to throw that back door lob or the um you know the great great pass into the high post or whatever and and I used that, uh, I, I, my philosophy, and it hasn't actually changed, even given the, I know we're going to talk about spacing and, and stuff, but um, I really, I really liked, and that was with, uh, 
by one of the reasons I, I spoke to Hubie Brown because he was doing it. I, I don't know how much actually in the NBA, but because um, he wouldn't have been allowed to play his own, but he had a lot of thoughts about keying on, you know, you'd make a jump shot, you're in one defense, you'd, you know, you'd make a layup, you're in another. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know I'm, me, I, you know, that was one of my tactics I've always had as, uh, you know, man on a make, zone on a miss, or vice miss. versa, yeah. zone, on a, zone on a make, man on a miss, you know, oh, sorry, man on a make, um, you know, those are, those, those are just two rhythm con concepts, you know, like take, really can mix up, uh, you know, get, get a team really un, un, unbalanced, you know, because they're uh, having to attack against something almost every different every time down. But you, but you couldn't play pure, any of the uh, defenses, you know, that we used couldn't be pure, couldn't be, you couldn't play a, like a, a standard, you know, middleman zone, for right. instance, you know, or even off front zone, whatever. You couldn't, you always had to have something that maintained pressure on the ball and the other guys were all in next cover. Who's my, you know, who's my next cover? I, want I think just, that. I want to ask one very important question. Uh, I don't think this question gets asked at, hardly at all in clinics or when coaches speak. Um, how did you um, develop your, uh, the, not this take, forget about the offense for the moment, the defense, yeah, yeah. defensive play calling. So did you number the defenses? Was it 175, 50? Was there a different, what, 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 how did you do that? Did you see that from Hubie, from um, Bob Knight, or did you make this up yourself that this is how I'm going to, I'm going to take some of these things and, and put them into these, to these defenses? No, I, I, absolutely. Um, the, uh, Dean, those Dean Smith ideas, I think, were they, I, which I really like because they were so so simple. You know, you, 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 if you're in twenty something, the, the first digit was whether you play man for man. You know, it's going to be man for man coverage, and uh, you know, the, the, then the the second digit was where the pickup point was. Right. Now I I watered it down, but I mean, down I, junior players could do it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I, I, I'd throw it at them, you know, say, what's our 22 half court man for man? Because two, you know, three was four was full court, three was three quarter court pickup, and Jesus two was half court, you know, and one was quarter court. Yeah. I mean, yeah. damn, you know, it took about no middle, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Used to camp in there. So yeah. no, I I that, that was a very simple thing to adapt. Now I did adapt it. It was a very simple uh, concept to me. But do you know, I think my junior kids got it quicker and sharper than the, than than some of some uh, senior guys you know right anyway that's <laughs> yeah no that's, that's another, another story okay. that's, that's a really yeah. interesting point because i do think that younger coaches um struggle with understanding you know how to put that 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 kind of structure together um a cohesive you know message structure you know like that's easy to understand and yeah so, yeah um it, it's it's a, it's an interesting one it's a completely different subject but i'm still absolutely interested to see how coaches at, in every level whether it's the nba but specifically here in the uk how they react when the crowds get back in because at this moment they're yeah. basically coaching like they're in practice and there's no pressure you know so they're just calling yeah, out yeah, a defense yeah. versus what happens when they the players can't hear the call um or it, you know it's much more uh, difficult to, to communicate well you know you know tom becker a fantastic coach um i know you and of course coach d know him very well um up at Sunderland, I, I can remember so he, he had colour codes yeah, going on the codes. side. Rick, you know, he was, Rob, he was uh, in run and jump on a red. And That's right. Rob uh, yeah, yeah. Dip, Dip Donaldson also used that a lot uh, in college. Uh, he had the assistant coach um, hold up the the color code um, to change the defense. I remember seeing it. I never ever. I don't. I don't think I coached against him too many times. But yeah, that was. Uh, that was yeah, that I'm. Tony, can I just say one other thing about, about um, influences? Do you know, I, I, and I was thinking about this the other day, that, the, that I think that there's no substitute for doing. I think I learned a lot. By, I mean, how many practices have I coached you know, oh, over the years? Okay, you know, I, you, you learn by that and study, obviously my study trips. And the other thing was I taught a lot of courses uh, ran the and uh, ran a Lilla Shawl advanced course, you know, a week residential course, and they say, you know, you you don't know something until you teach it. 
Well, I, I, I think that actually really did, um, really did help me. And looking way back, I should say, um, the guy that started me in basketball as a, as a school kid, Tony Smith, uh, I mean, sadly, no longer with us, but, but, you know, he was a fundamentalist. And I do think that some of my thoughts about the fundamentals still come, he was fascinated by the hand in shooting and how it turns and all this stuff, you know? Right. So That's that I, I got that. I, I, I don't want to, you know, it would be remiss no, no, no. of me not to, not to mention, not to mention that. Sorry, mate. Um, just good, going back to the man-to-man -man, uh, philosophy. Yeah. Um, so right back, you know, taking it through kind of the eras. At the start, you, like you said, you were, you know, it was the Bobby Knight philosophy. Were you, um, you know, very aggressively no middle? And was it a diagonal stance to the ball, you know, si sideline, baseline? Um, and how has that changed over the years, um, considering now the players are so gifted with the with the dribble drive yeah um well i think with that i think the 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 way it's changed the way we guard one pass away hasn't it you know um and how and how we uh, and how we rotate or how teams rotate so i i i still think that the the um uh you know some of the his adjust some of the adjustments that you that you make and i think keeping somebody in front we you know we talk about it a lot but i i i it's it's just really hard to do um there's no no question about that but i i think you know somebody can't beat you off the dribble and if they haven't got the ball you know? so, yeah. i mean there are some there are some things you can do but i i I, going back to my previous thing, it was, I, I think that's one of the strengths of a of match up hybrid type zones. You know, you you if the guy can see people in front of him, you know, the more people he sees in front of him, the tougher it's going to be to 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 come off a, a one on one dribble. Yeah. But I, I, I don't have a magic answer for that. I've got to say. What, um... I mean, also, I mean, now you're you, you, you're advising your coaches and stuff now, and you're seeing these younger players. I mean, are we are we losing the emphasis of actually controlling the dribbler? Is or is it the dribbler is so so gifted now? I I I, I sense that there's there's sometimes there's a lot of like just literally giving up almost on some plays. You know, when they get close to each other, they're almost letting this guy pass them without like real having that real desire to stay in front is that am i right in thinking yeah that? yeah I, I i think one an interesting idea i think is that you, you know the tough allowing a tough two as opposed to a to the three-point shot so almost inviting them you know running people oh. off three-point line and accepting the fact that they're going to you know it's a percentage isn't it they, they're going to get into a tough into a tough two and then obviously quick rotations maybe you know xing on the on the weak side to when they reverse the ball that that sort of thing um but yeah i i i you can't you can't uh, give up <laughs> i mean no. you know, <laughs> you've got to keep you know you that's that that that's uh that's a no no but i do think you can you can guide you know um you can, and it's about your body position, isn't it? When you when you first uh, handle the guy and understanding the space, uh, one of the difficulties is that you know um, a lot of guys will be open if your hands are down. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> yeah, no, no, so, no, absolutely. So okay. yeah, so I, I I'm more inclined on that. Uh, the you know the idea of one guy guards the ball, four people help. I think you take away the three and and you you try and and create a tough two um because the mid-range shot it, you know that's probably the toughest isn't it i yeah. don't know oh no absolutely i mean i i i had this discussion with rob pan the other day um and you know my philosophy has always been pretty much the same in in this kind of you know new era you know when a team when a team can make 10 threes on you plus 10 and more you know 
you are really up against it. You really yeah. are. It's 30 points, you know, whatever way you want to look at it, you know, Absolutely. then they score, they score 20 points in transition and, you know, then they only need another, you know, 20 or 30 points in other parts of the game. It's, it, you know, so I've always felt that if you defend the three point line and you keep a team, you know, eight and below, it's almost manageable. Right. You're always going to be in a game, you know, when they're at 10 or 15 frees a game, it's, it's really, Absolutely. really hard. You know, so yeah, no, it it changes the, the three. You can't, yeah, I mean, you can't win, um, you know, if you don't have great three point defense. I think that's that's or or ways or a system of making sure that you get coverage. And then if there is a mismatch, it, as I say, it possibly doesn't matter to us about fly by, <laughs> you know, closeouts. It possibly doesn't matter so much, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting one. I've been um, talking to some coaches and also looking at that philosophy of um, so like, you know, like you say, on a flush or, a, a, you know, a, a real hard closeout, which takes you past that dribbler. Um, you know, the traditional way that I've taught is that player has to get back into the same to the play, you know, on that same player. I'm now, you know, starting to teach, ah, you know, babe. that that player is peeling back to the next rotation and there's someone that's on Absolutely. the help. Absolutely. Um, and that's forcing all kinds of rotations across the core. And like you say, you are hoping to get like this middle two point floating type shot for that player contested. Um, and then you're going to have Especially to Especially if there's a big, them. if there's a big coming, you know, Absolutely. Um, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, that's uh, that's something. Uh, I think the game is definitely changing in that way. And, yeah, I, I, like yeah, that. no, I agree. It is. Yeah. Um. Talk, so, talking about how things are changing, you know, talking talk a little bit about um, spacing and the ball screen. Now, you know, we talked about that that rules based approach to motion. You know, to the to kind yeah. of traditional motion offense. I mean, back then. Um, you know, the pick and roll was, uh, you know, was a very, you know, was used, <laughs> it was, it was something, you know, that was slowly coming into the game. I mean, now, um, you know, it's multiple ball screen actions, you know, most yeah. some decoy to bring slot, lots of slot built ball screens, you know, a lot of side different change in the angle. What well, get, talk to me about, you know, the ball screen and, and spacing in, in the game in, in, in state. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, it's an evolution I've seen. I mean, but, um, uh, the Knights thought originally on that he didn't like the the ball screen because his argument was it brought defense to the ball, Absolutely. and um, yeah, you know, which yeah, I, I I can remember running practices again, preparing a team and putting in the ball screen because we've got to guard it, you know, and and it was. It was really successful, you know. Uh, they were I'm thinking, damn, you know, this this is uh, this is interesting. But more importantly, originally it was really a two man thing, wasn't it? It, 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 it? I don't know, but today it's used. It's a device that's used to create scramble in defense, create advantage, and then get the defense scrambling, isn't it? Um, and then and, and going back to reading, and of course within the the two man action you 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 you've got to uh, read uh, you can't it's just not automatic uh, i can remember i coached the gb um uh world student games team uh, out in izmir and we played lithuania uh, i mean the guys did well we had some late you know pops who was going to be on that team and uh and Samana Luel Deng was going to be on it. But anyway, we had withdrawals. But we played uh, Lithuania and it was going into the end game. It was it was close. You know, it was it was even or, or we were down one or whatever. Anyway, two times they come down the floor and just ran the traditional two man game on one side of the floor cleared out, you know, really quite, quite basic. But uh, they just scored on consecutive offers. We lost by five, I think. So um, that was one way of using the ball screen. But now, my God, how creative are people with it, yeah. both guarding it and, and actually using it. Younger age groups in this country, I've been looking at some, you know, uh, EBA, EABL and even some National League stuff, and some of it could be terrible. <laughs> yeah. There's no advantage created at all. 
No. So you, you, you've got to create advantage. Um, and I, I've always wondered, but if you could have a guided patea stay attached to the, to the handler, it could really stay, could anticipate it, get over it, you know, stay attached. Sure. You wouldn't have any mismatch. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that, um, you know, I mean, you, we, we can name all of the, the coverages on, on ball screens, but I even, I, you know, at clinics, I actually say to them, you know, the first, the first coverage of the ball screen is to blow it up. And that's by getting over and defending, yeah. the ball, do, putting enough pressure on the ball handler that he can't use the screen. Now, let's you know if we look at our own country here that's achievable in the uk it's not achievable in europe um and potentially in the rest of the world because in europe the the screening is so dynamic and so strong and they allow so much movement you know it's literally uh, sprint right. plant at, at the at the moment of contact in the UK, in the BBL, they call that an offensive foul, you know, where, yeah. whereas, yeah. whereas they're using their hip, um, you know, and it's really, really hard. Normally that the, the ball, and, th and this comes back to learning that, that reading of the screen and using the screen, like you say, creating an advantage. Our ball handlers just allow a, a gap and then now they can, the player can get over. And in yeah. Europe, they're just taught to use that shoulder and get right into the screener and now they're coming off and now the defense really has to react then to the next phase um, because that player is just dead he's just died on the on a 610 big big body kind of thing. <laughs> big body, yeah you know? <laughs> i think one of the one of the the, the the actions i do like out of it are actually three man actions that, or that, that you know if i was coaching today i'd want to run uh, I'd want to screen for the guy that was was going to end up as the ball handler, Absolutely. you know, because then they're showing so you can slip it. There's all sorts of, and then they've got to rotate. You're into creating that advantage. I really like that. And I see there seems to be a trend towards like ghost screens as well, doesn't Absolutely. it? I mean, a just, lot of ghost screens. Yeah. Just, just, just uh, sprinting at the guy and then go, and the defense is already anticipating <laughs> yeah. the bigs out of position. And the other, the other, I think the most effective, because I, I wanted to talk about transition at some stage, but the, it is the drag screen. Yeah. Um, be, especially when their big, you know, stays in the lane. Um, well, and, and because he's springing back, you know, he's I mean, trying to get to there. The thing with the yeah. drag screen is that, um, I mean, I actually, I'm going to say about spacing as well in a minute, but the, the thing with, the, with that drag screen is, you know, what do you do with a player like Steph Curry? Now I know that we don't have a Steph Curry in our country, but <laughs> I wish we wished we did. But you, you know, most, most most players, you know, are you know have some some of you know the, you know like a Raymond Fletcher, or, you know, when when you're in a drag situation, he was terrific. He he was was terrific. Was this weekend, this this whole last yeah, he week. was terrific in that final, yeah. And you know, with him, you know, you're you're big. You know, you're traditionally told, you know, if you're a big, you know, sprint back to the rim, protect the paint. But you just can't be in that situation now. And no. what I used to talk uh, with drag screen action was, you know, go under. But now it's really hard. So now you're almost like you're forcing that, you know, forcing him to use the screen and to drive the lane because you don't want that player to, to, to be able to come off and get a clean look, a player of that level anyway. Um, no. you're right. Drag screen action, um, double drag, all of those actions are so important as a, as a transition basis. I wanted just to say though on the spacing, which I found really interesting. Um, and I know that the, the, the NBA have started to use this, um, this front cut um, is, is running even on any single high action. If, you, if that player, like, let's say, is coming off from right to left and he's coming off the screen and it's a drop coverage you know, by the big, by the, the, big player, the player in the corner, a lot of the time, you know, his defender is his eyes are looking at the ball and a lot of teams are running that front cut in front of that player yeah. for the, for the layup at the ring, because, you know, maybe, maybe the big has helped up a little bit and the spacing now is so great. Everyone has to be somewhat attached in some sort of way um, to these three point shooters. So there's some really interesting concepts when you talk about this four out, you know, five out spacing now for cutting. And I believe 
and just I just I want to just get your thoughts on this that a yeah. coach such as yourself would probably be even more successful now because of the way you taught some of the actions back cut you know this front cut the re reading yeah. of that um versus you know because there's no question there's a there's a there's a downs downs uh, downsizing of of the skill development of some of these things in our country yeah no and that, uh, you're absolutely right that that's um that's down to reading i think you know we, with the european european idea you know playing out in the middle of the floor uh much more and then to me, I, some offenses looked a bit stationary, you know. But um, that, but then when you really break it down, you can see that some of those cuts people are reading. You know, they're, they're absolutely people turning, you know, defenders turning their heads, and that's that's a read. So you face cutting or not even back cutting. You can you can even face uh, cut that. Yeah, face cut. yeah I, I I agree, but I, it still goes back to the principle of of reading, and I think that comes out even more in transition right. because I think, you know, with the shot clock uh, in the game, there are so many possessions in a game. And as coaches, I do think we spend a lot of time on what we're doing in the half court with a recovered defense and what we're doing, you know, in the half court with against a recovered defense. Oh. And yet there's all these opportunities in transition. And uh, believe me, I've, I've I've run some of the prettiest early offenses you've ever seen. <laughs> but unfortunately, the defense doesn't cooperate. So, no. so you, <laughs> you know, in, in uh, transition, I, uh, if you can get to the point where you're not, you know, you're not turning it over when you've got advantage uh, offensively, and if defensively you can get to the point where you're recovering, uh, you know, you, um, I, I can remember. I think it, it was, uh, who the hell was it? Um, I can't remember who it was now, but I, I, I was at a clinic and somebody's talking about drop two. So delineating who was going to, who was going to get back first without losing offensive rebounds, yeah. you know, the ability to get position to rebound. Uh, but anyway, if, if you can, um, if you can study, I think, what happens in transition and all of those opportunities, you know, the transition three best shot in the game to well, me. <laughs> I was actually going to bring that up. I've just written it on my notes. So, yeah. I mean, there obviously uh, one part of the game, which, you know, as, as, as older coaches and we're, you know, more experienced coaches, we're starting, we're having to learn about is the analytics part of the game. Um, yeah, some of this stuff that's coming out of the NBA, um, unbelievable. We we know and we understand the basic analytic of three is worth more than two. You know, we understand that. So, like you said, in transition, when you pass ahead, whether it's point to you know what it's his wing fast break, a sideline fast break, or whether you're you know making some sort of cross court pass, which I don't like, but you know, let's say that that happens. And you just take these pull-up threes um, with no offensive rebounding. I mean, we understand. I understand the basic analytics of that. The facts are, it's a shot. If it goes in, it's worth three. If it doesn't go in, most of the time, your team is not out of position defensively. You can easily recover five yeah. below the ball. And you know, it's just a, it's a, a, point, a five second differential in, in the game. So we all understand right. this basics, but again, you know, in a purest form, you know, especially coaching younger players, it's so, you know, it's so hard to see this physically I... with our eyes, you know, and, and what it's doing to some of our junior players. Like I remember you, you were saying about, you know, searching out the, the highest percentage shot, the best shot. And that, that surely is not a great shot, especially in the UK. Yeah, I, it's all about levels, isn't it? So you, you, you've got to teach on on rebounding. By the way, the the I think if you because it's a recovering defense, I think offensive rebounding is um, easy. is easier. Right, it's, it's actually easier. Um, uh, I, I can remember actually setting a whole game up with Czechoslovakia. I was coaching England. We played Czechoslovakia at Granby Halls, you know, in Leicester. Yeah. And the, the idea was um, that we would shoot early. 
you know, everybody was talking about, okay, you know, work, work for it, but you are working together to get a shot you can make shoot early because, you know, they can't, they can't rebound defensively. Uh, they can, they're not, the box out or the block out isn't sure. as, uh, as effective. But yeah, no, it is. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's the modern game. And if that's where we're going, um, I don't necessarily mean we've got to follow the, the, the NBA and that massive rise in, on a percentage basis. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a shot you can practice in the gym on your own, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah, but I, 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 you know, I agree with you. Um, but you can't help but think, um, with even one rebounder, you know, it's got to be a, it's got, it's got to be a good shot. There is time and score involved, of course. Yeah, of well. course there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, we'll come on to that in a minute. But, um, yeah. you know, let's talk about, um, you know, one of the things that I took, you know, away from yourself as, you know, even as a young player and and then, you know, obviously seeing Coach Dunn in, um, in, in effect was this incredible organization of practice um yeah you know the the and 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 the role that drills played in those practices so you know talk a little bit about that you know how you develop that philosophy and how that you develop that also but also about the role of drills in developing a player you know in and we're talking more about repetition versus game situations which you've briefly touched yeah on. um yeah i i do you know, I, I've in latter years, um, I've I don't even like the word drill. Oh. <laughs> I think it kind of sounds robotic, <laughs> you know, that you're you're teaching ro uh, robots. But obviously, with closed skills and so on, you have to you, you, repetition is is obviously really important. But but I think yeah, I I think um, a player d d will not develop. Uh, through drills uh, alone, uh, you know, he, he's got to be exposed to, to a whole series of, of environments, you know, scrimmage. I mean, just absolutely no, no coach scrimmage, you know, just so he can experience it. He's got a, um, I think he, he, his development is in, he's got a scrimmage and have conditioned scrimmage sure. in practice. And he's got to, play games you know you do to get those experiences but um i would say early on uh, because of the rules based stuff i was running on offense that offensive drills tended to my office tended to, the great thing about it was that in breakdown two two three three whatever it was four four you were practicing your offense whilst practicing the fundamental so if you're if you're practicing, you got three guys involved in a in a in a drill, you know, down screen drill or something, you're you're practicing what you're gonna do in in the in in the drill. So in the game, sorry. So uh, my my thought on that was that you know I, I, I'm practicing it, so breakdown drills are, are good. But the it, I think it's a question of how much you do, isn't it? That's right. what. I mean, equally, you don't roll the balls out and scrimmage for two hours. No, I, I, I mean, I, 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 this is a really interesting subject, I find. Um, and I understand where, you know, some of our community, so I put that in loose words, some of the, some of the coaches are, are going with this game-based approach. Um, I hear this, you know, you know, oh, Spain, yeah. are a games-based approach, uh, you know, that's how they teach. Well, I, 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 I debate that in a big way. And plus also, historically, they're still great teachers of the individual fundamentals. And then, and, and, yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, the, the, my my counter to that has always been, um, well, what about Serbia? and the Eastern Bloc countries, you know, they are still in blocked practice, you know, it's repetition. Now, they, they also have this incredible environment where they play pick up, they play basketball 24 hours a day, it's part of their yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they see the intricate details of players, you know, executing a skill so now they can copy all of these things. Um, but I do say there is this, you know, 
authoritarian dictatorish <laughs> role in Serbia. And by the way, they're producing some of the best players in the world, you know, in it's, the world. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It's, 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 think... it's a tough one to talk about always to say someone has the right answer or the wrong answer. I mean, that's my personal no, view. No, it, it is. It is balanced, but it's the quality of the drills, isn't it? It's that's what true. it's understanding what you're trying to get out of them uh, and what you're trying to achieve with them. And, um, uh, and then setting them up in such a way that, that they, you know, that, that there's rotation in it, that it's on one side of the floor and the other side of the floor uh, and attention to detail. Cause it's, that's where you can, you can coach the detail, just screening, you know, um, I, have, I had a famous situation at Reading where, uh, when I was at Reading, where I remember an American player we brought in and I, we were talking about a down screen action and um, he said, I asked coach, I, I know how to, well, you know, I know how to, how to screen, you know, I know, and I know how to come off the screen. So I said, oh, that's great. Let's go, you know. And of course, yes. I'm teaching the angle of the screen, uh, reading if he's above you, what you're doing. That, and he, he couldn't do it to save his life, you know, because he'd been taught, right, guy comes down, hits your man and you pop up. Yes. Yeah. And that was it. And the the and he's setting the screen a down screen with his shoulders to the baseline, which is the easiest thing to slip around because you're not a big enough. You know, if it's an angle, you're a much bigger target. Stuff like that. So yeah, it is it is the quality of the of the drill. I think. Right, that's an interesting point. Um, one quick question on um, developing the player. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested to, to, to know your thoughts on this. Um, the, it, forget about the fact that we probably still aren't a very good passing nation, but our biggest deficiency is still shooting the basketball. And as yeah. this is the most important skill in the world of basketball now, it's, it's not even questionable. What, what, yeah. what do you think, we're, where are we failing as a nation um, when it comes to teaching first the technique and then secondly, you know, how it evolves in, you know, as, as, as you get older and, and uh, to the next levels? Yeah, I, I, I think it's about the, the, the focus in shooting practice. I think you can shoot for an hour and not improve, you know, <laughs> not get anywhere or you, you shoot around, so to speak, you know, or you can have a focus seven minutes and, uh, and really be better, but it's the mechanics, isn't it? It's the, it, I reckon I could walk into almost 40% of the gyms in this country, watching a group practice shooting and simply change the arc of the shot and <laughs> <laughs> the way that they and they're automatically going to be better right. just as simple as that you know and then that comes down to the the detail of the technique um and then it's the decision you know when to shoot but i i, I, I again i think it's the um obviously the volume uh, um, the, i think it's been shown that volume shooting in itself isn't the solution it's the quality of what you do um, and 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 the mechanics uh, and also the mental aspect. I think success, you know, success sure. um, equals confidence, and confidence breeds success. Uh, I don't know. That's the answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's a really good point. Um, yeah. I, I just want to know, though, your thoughts as as a governing body um, or, or whoever. Do you think that we we should be emphasizing more on shooting considering that's such, you know, such a deficiency and, and it shows up at every level that we play at. Yeah. I think that's been, I think that's been sort of a dread, you know, when the um, performance stuff was coming in, I think that was sort of a addressed or identified, wasn't it? But there were so many things that we weren't good at. It kind of got lost, didn't it? you know, um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I, we we should really putting the ball in the basket is is the most important fundamental without question. So I think there should be a massive um, emphasis on that, and I, and also 
within each individual practice you know you've you've got to it's so easy go through a practice and you're running this you're running that and then you've got team stuff and so and then you say yeah, we haven't shot right. now I, I've, got, I've got to say that i had a fairly recent experience of a coach saying to me well now my guys are are experienced the veterans we we they don't need to practice shooting so, <laughs> okay. Well, so okay uh, I'll give you I'll give you my uh, I'll give you my um, uh, story from Japan, which was um, when we did our season ending interviews uh, at the end of last season, um, almost every Japanese player said, uh, coach, um, you don't need to do shooting drills in practice. We shoot an hour before practice and an hour after practice. Right. And it's absolutely true that game speed with proper drills, they were shooting before and after practice. And, um, right. you know, they just felt that uh, um, I just messed up. You know, I didn't need to use that time in practice to shoot because, of course, I was so used to putting shooting drills in between some of the actual practice itself. Of course. Um, to yeah, get yeah. The, the repetitions up. So, yeah, it's crazy, crazy, crazy scenario. Um, talk about a little bit about um, uh, the role of the timeout and making some in-game adjustments. You talk about changing defense. It's really interesting to know what keys those um, and then also your philosophy in, time, in taking timeouts and how did you evolve that? You know, what, what were you, you know, did you, did you dictate to players? You know, what were you, how were you using the board, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I I'm going to start with Lillishaw, right? So I met with a guy, a football coach called Dave Sexton once. I um, mean, he, he's not long with us, but he was famous uh, as a great thinker in, in soccer, you know, and so on. And it was really interesting because we used to train there and um, he was there with the, with the FA school. And he was absolutely envious of the fact that the coach in basketball had so much game time contact with, you know, with 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 the team. And and then I saw some uh, real, you're like, there's some real, the best time out I ever heard. Uh, was I saw some grainy old film of Red Orback coaching the Celtics, wow. walking up and down saying, get me the rebound, get me the rebound, get me the rebound. That's all he said in the whole of the timeout. Wow. Uh, no, no strategy, no doubt. No, but anyway, no. uh, it's, uh, that's, that's extreme. And of course, he had a relationship with players where he was the boss too, so he was paying their salaries, you know. Yeah. So the me bit, as opposed to get us, yeah. was interesting. <laughs> but yeah. But I think it starts with a possession by possession mentality as a coach, and you can change. You know, don't burn timeouts. I think that's the big lesson, isn't it? Absolutely. To to have them at the end of uh, in crucial situations. Um, and maybe, you know, use substitutions or switching in coverage, which, you know, you need a system for doing that through a player, through an individual player or huddle. Um, and I, and you, can, you can get to the point where by having a possession by possession mentality, you want a next play mentality or the players need a next, next play mentality. But you as the coach should be possession by possession sure. so that, in a high scoring game, you might go eight, nine down, 10 down, whatever. And actually you're getting good shots, you know, they're making sure there's no need, you know, unless you want to stop their momentum. Uh, but in a low scoring game, you could, you could go four down. And if you have a possession by possession mentality, you're more likely to uh, be able to read that and call a timeout. But, but Did you you've got to have a system for timeouts. Yes. Yeah. yeah you know, and I, I think you've got to refer always in timeouts to prepar uh, to what you've done in preparation. I, I like Greg Popovich talking about this, actually. Um, try and get through a timeout, coach, without using the word don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. just, try, just try, you know. Um, you know, for example, I mean, you don't foul. You know, at the end of the <laughs> game, you know, you mind, you. they say, oh, I'm going to remind my guys, don't foul, don't foul. I used to, I used to or often run a practice, a drill at the end of practice, consecutive stops. Yeah. You know, where you go split into three, three on three, you've got to get two stops to come off defense. 
use two balls. So it's a constant onslaught. Yeah. So, and if you foul, you go back to zero. Yeah. So if in a timeout, you say, oh, guys, that. just like consecutive stops, yeah. just like consecutive stops, you know, you refer to something that you've prepared sure. and that you've prepared to, and that you've practiced. I'm not a great fan of this thing about drawing this up or drawing that up. You know, I, I know you can draw up adjustments maybe and that sort of thing, but some magic play that you suddenly draw up and everybody says, oh, he's brilliant. And then he, they don't score and it's, oh, that's a terrible play, you know. I think, <laughs> it's, it's, I it's think now um, it's what I've learned, you know, of course we're all different. Um, I, I definitely felt I was under-resourced with um, end of game you know, EOGs and end of sideline, you know, sideline yeah. um, plays yeah. at the end of the games. Um, so I, I actually started, I, I had done this from, from probably pretty much from Germany. So every, every higher level that I've been at. So I was starting to um, put what I call the black series in and we would dummy that normally once a week. Um, we all we would play it once a week uh, against some sort of defense, so we knew that it were like, so for argument's sake, ten drill, ten ten plays, uh, end of game, full court um, play, um, a, a, a baseline out of bounds, some sidelines. Once I got to Japan, I realized because we were playing sixty games a year. We needed yeah, yeah. more. We needed to, to really get a lot of those kind of plays in because we were always constantly in these sideline end of game situations, and we needed to advance the ball and, and run a and run a really. But, good play. but that's in preparation, isn't it? Preparation, that, that, absolutely. So the timeout, so you can re, you can refer refer to that, or even Ab signal it. Uh, absolutely. But you could you can only make one or two intelligent points in a timeout. Totally, in my opinion. Yep. You know, you, 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 you can't, you can't run a clinic, you know, anyway, I was, I, you, you've got to have a ritual as well. Right. Exactly. It's got to be, there's got to be some sort of consistency in there. There's, there's, yeah. there's no, there's no doubt. Um, when, uh, when you, were you, did you have a system, you know, cause you'd coach so many games. Um, did, did you have a system where, okay, um, I go down six, you know, or eight, I'm going to call a timeout, you know, or, or let's say they score three possessions in a row. I know a couple of coaches, I've seen it, they, the team score three possessions in a row and they call an automatic timeout if they've yeah, got that timeout. Yeah. Um, or were you more feel for the game? You know, I trust my team. Um, free, we can make these three possessions up. There were some issues there or I'll change it. I'll make a substitution. Was, were you more feel versus system and that that also goes with substitutions as well yeah 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 early early on i you know i was i think i just wanted so much control you know i think i was i was so neurotic about about that but definitely feel came and i think and i again i can identify when that was beginning to happen you know um so i think the second uh, in my case, uh, and as I say, you can't. It's difficult to have hard and fast rules. You know, you. Sure. It's it's a it's a it's a game with different dynamics. Every time the ball goes up, there's a there's a different dynamic. You you like the players have got to read and and adjust. Yeah. So That's yeah, cool. no, I think I think, but that does come with experience. Right. You know, you you can you sort of can anticipate things. You know. Uh, I, I know I've seen a steal and I've gone to the, the table and called a timeout before I've even seen the, you know, the end of that particular sequence. Cause I know, I know what it's going to be, you know. Um, on this same kind of subject, I asked this to most of the senior coaches um, yeah. when you uh, post game. So, you know, post game, were you, were you into players straight away? um you know straight into the locker room you know with a with a debrief and then what was your next process like um watch the video of the game and then review with the team you know some days later what what, what was your process and what what you know how did that evolve as well yeah no that that i got that changed i got better at that when when uh, towards the i don't know last 20 years or something sure. i think um uh you've got to you've got to say what you can build on 
you, you've got to say something positive. You, you, you can't, you know, after a game, you've got to think about that. And plus it takes the emotion out, you know, uh, and then you've got a chance to uh, look at what actually happened on, on tape. I, I think that, you know, quite often a coach, you can be wrong. Totally you can right. be so wrong about something, you know, <laughs> you can say, well, yeah, why there? And then you see yeah, you got <laughs> screened off and we should have switched it, you know, yeah. that's that, that sort of thing. So I think you've got to take the emotion out and it, but it does depend on what level you're coaching at and, um, and not, not that basic idea. I think you've got to, you've got to do that. But then the post, you know, the analysis, you know, they say a great expression that feedbacks the champ is the champ breakfast of champions. And um, I think that's absolutely right. You know, the, the, the quality of the feedback then becomes, you know, you see a performance gain going forward. Right. Um, if Did it's you, poor, then it won't be. Were you, um, do, you know, in the past 15 years or so when video 10 10 years when video became you know much more available were you having these team feedback sessions and you were directing you know hey um why didn't we help in this situation johnny why you know why were you late on the help uh you know why did was the help not helping someone else you know what why why didn't we make this extra pass and you know being what we would term coaching if you had said that to me at 14 years old um i would have said yes sir yes sir you know my yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. now players seem to find a way to think that that's been critical um what yeah, what, yeah, what, what's, yeah. what's what's what, what was your philosophy well, there and, and how has it changed yeah i definitely changed i changed it to how you know how are we going to guard the ball screen you know <laughs> so you you show the tape and then going back to practice you can say you can it's evident you know that we didn't show on it if that's what we were doing um or or whatever but the but the i think the the, the value of um video feedback is in very small groups it's having you and one player or two players mm, it's very difficult to do it i think and maintain focus with a whole group right. with the whole team you know uh I mean, the best situation I ever had was at Reading, you know, we, where we had an end room in the gym. Sure. We had the, the practice gym and then an end room and we would go in there. Great thing about that was, uh, and, you know, I saw Coach K do this at, uh, yet, um, never forget where he is, Duke. That's right. Yeah. At Duke, where, where he'd be on the floor and then go off into the film room with two guys. And then come back on the whilst the assistants were running it, you know. So I think it's overestimated what you can do with a with a with a full team, and underestimated what you can do, you know, with one or two guys max. Really? It might be positional, you know, sure. yeah, um, it, if you believe in positions as such. But let me let me just quickly tell you a Joe Pace story. I, you know, Joe was NBA sense that I had at uh, Hamill I mentioned earlier. And uh, I can remember thinking, right, well, you know, we're getting very sophisticated here. This is back in the 80s. We've got a film room. We've got a, a place where we can run some film. So we're, we're looking at this film. I'm making some coaching points. And he just said, uh, coach, uh, actually, he took me aside. It was afterwards. He didn't embarrass me. He just took me aside. He said, coach, I'll get the rebound and I'll throw it to a guard and he has to go score. If I don't get a re if he doesn't score, then he should wait for me to come down the floor, throw it to me, and I'll dunk. <laughs> it's pretty simple with him. With his, with his I thought, ability. Hey, this is a simple game. Yeah, a does. simple game. But no, definitely, it, it, it is how you do it, but people have got to be accountable. Right. You know, you, you can't, I, I mean, shot selection is probably the most difficult thing to be accountable for. But again, if you, you know, five goes back to five guys working together to get a shot we can make you yeah, know that's great um talk about uh coach development today um i mean the whole you i ask the question almost every time about yeah you know, our fraternity you know and you know where we are as a as a as a coaching as a as coaches in this day and age and where you were when you first started out obviously when you first started out 
like, you know, uh, coaches that came before you, like Coach Collins, and then afterwards, Coach Dunning, and all of these other coaches, you know, it was, it was yeah. scarce resources. And I think the drive to learn was, was probably even more. Now it's completely different. It's the exact opposite. Well, talk, talk about that uh, yeah. from there to where we are now. Well, that's an, a really interesting. Tony, can I say something about the Olympic legacy on this? Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't have to worry about this. So uh, I, I thought it was an absolute wasted opportunity. And frankly, for uh, in terms of coach development, uh, to have in the sit on the sit on the men's side, you know, to have. Um, administrators sitting on the bench at the Olympics, I think was, was nothing short of disgrace for coach development yeah. in this country. I'm sorry, but I don't, I, I feel so strongly about that. We had two great minds coaching, yeah. obviously, as they've gone on to, uh, yeah. to prove, but, you know, we could have had a head coach and, and the, the lead assistant could have been a head coach, an American leader could have been uh, British. There were plenty of British coaches who could have filled those roles. What anybody says, absolutely could but they were learning you know could have been learning i think uh, i think it was an absolute wasted opportunity and tragic um yeah. but anyway that's my rent no you I, don't, I, I, totally i've heard other people talk about it and we can't we can't you got to say it like it is yeah you absolutely. know that that was wrong it was yeah. just flat out uh, wrong anyway um yeah coach development today um, the, the thought I had the other day was that, you know, that, in fact, I was talking, I think, with Alan uh, Keane, you know, at uh, Reading. Yeah. And um, he said, yeah, uh, as a throwaway comment about, you know, there's almost too many, there's almost too much, too much. You, you can research, you know, too many resources. And I think what we end up with is, and I think that's true today, I think um, become YouTube coaches, you know, <laughs> you you. You, you, there's a danger that we're, we're developing maybe, you know, uh, certainly being academic about it. So there's not, I don't have a problem with that and understanding uh, and having ideas, but you've got to settle. And you've, whatever you settle on, you've got to know to the nth degree. Yep. So get an idea, go ahead and research them, but have an idea of how you want to play the game or what's important about maximizing potential. But, but and I, I think but, but it's I a think, danger, isn't it? Yeah, but I think just going back to your point, um, you know, towards the star, um, you know, once you get these ideas, the most important thing is you've got to go on the floor and you've got to, t you've got to go and execute them. And, you know, I, I, like I tell lots of young coaches, you know, sometimes I run a drill or a play. I realize straight away that it's not correct, whether it's for not correct for the group or it hasn't worked for the level or whatever. And yeah. you've got to hold your yeah. hand up and say, you know, guys, we're going to junk that. Um, let's move on. But that's that, you know, learning or, or we make an adjustment or a player turns around and says, coach, actually, if I flare screen this guy and slip, it'll be better than you just asking me to make this action here. And you're like, oh, actually, that really does work. You know, let's add that. Yeah, in. yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, I, and, and I think that too many of these younger coaches are, like you said, just watching the video and putting it down and talking and talking, but not actually being on the floor. I, I actually think you've got, I mean, learning from players, by the way, that's an, I, I should have mentioned that. I think that's a, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I think uh, with putting it on the floor and showing some leadership on the floor, and I think there's an argument for, I know there are different coaching styles, but insistent coaching, I think, is important. And that's based on your belief. If you believe something and, that, and, and you thought it through and you can put it on the floor and say, look, this is why we're doing it. But then if you're running drills, as you say, uh, and you think, I'm not getting out of this, what, what we should get out of it, junk it. Yeah. you know don't do it and the other um thing i see is with young coaches in team preparation i saw uh, you know before the lockdown i mean i'm talking about now but i saw a guy working with his team on zone attack uh, i call it attack as opposed to offense but anyway sure. on zone attack and it just went on and on <laughs> and on and on and the guys were clearly, you know, it was the, the, the defense didn't represent what a defense should be because yeah. they were getting fed up with it. The offense 
was just getting, uh, you know, just wasn't executing, wasn't having success with it. You, you've got to go 10 minutes and then go do something else, then come back, do another 10 minutes and then come back and then do another 10 minutes. Now you've done half an hour on attacking a zone, uh, but you haven't done it all in one, in all in one chunk, you know. Um, there, there, there are, uh, that, that would be my fear. But listen, I think there are, with young coaches, with, with coaches, especially the, guys you know for any abl and there's some fantastic coaching going on mm. and people pursuing coaching really getting after really. it and wanting yep. to understand yeah but just just you know settle settle on something that you can defend intellectually know it to the nth degree and then go and do it yeah do it and do it and do it you know on the floor do it i think that's the that's for me the the key. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts, you know, quickly on um, why do you think, though, um, we as a sport um, are still underutilizing um, coaches such as yourself, you know, Coach John Collins and, you know, Bob Martin, Jeff Jones, Mark Clark, all of these, you know, like mm. the legends of coaching. Why do you think we're underutilizing um, some of our best, you know, knowledge and best, you know, uh, ex, you know, coaches, even if they're not coaching on the front line anymore, um, unlike say Spain or Italy or Serbia or these yeah. other countries where they have a culture where that, that person is, they might not be like, I mean, you're taking someone like Warwick Khan, Warwick, I thought, was retired when he came to the UK. Now he's back <laughs> in Australia and he still has a position, it. you know, in Queensland in some capacity. I think he's the chairman of coaching. Um, yeah, why, yeah. why are we why are we just not utilizing, you know, people like yourself and, and or, or putting a structure together to allow that? I, uh, who knows? You know, I really don't know. I think out of sight, out of mind, perhaps. Um, but you're right. I mean, certainly in Europe, I, I again, I relate everything back to my own experience. The um, <clears throat> Russian Olympic coach, um, G Gamolsky, yeah. you know, he, um, I, had the, I had a fantastic opportunity to coach against him, actually, but it didn't end well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, well, neither could it, but, you know. But um, he, uh, in the four-year cycle, you know, in two of those years, he was working with, I mean, from mini basketball upwards. You know, he's the Olympic coach. Yeah. But he's in there, obviously, helping um, uh, other young coaches um, and helping develop, which creates a, a, a sort of a production line, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I think, I, think, um, I think coaches who, older coaches, who have... Um, the attitude of uh, I want to be in the modern game. I want to, you know, certainly I have this. I don't, I don't want to be an old fogey, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't live with a modern game, doesn't understand the modern game. I try and keep updated every summer, particularly. Um, but why, why uh, those resources aren't being used? Uh, I mean, I am doing a bit of mentoring, but on a, on a more formal way, Sure. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it may work. Well, maybe it's thought that there's better knowledge uh, and better influences in other places. And clearly other countries have been uh, more successful than, uh, than us. So maybe it's just not thought that uh, the depth is there. And yet we've been in gyms for years and years, you know, taking care of business. So yeah. I, I, I don't know, Tony. I, I, that's, that's, that's the truth. Okay. Um... Rapid fire uh, questions. Favorite basketball drill? <laughs> yeah, he said you don't uh, like drills anymore. So favorite basketball practice stroke drill? <laughs> yeah, I, I like. Yeah, I like um, uh, practice. Um, favorite drill? Right. I, I, I like conditioned five on five, and I, uh, you know, um, I particularly like. Um, Give me a couple, all right? I like um, I like one drill where, where you go, you play seven points or something. Anyway, the offense has to score five on five. The offense has to score uh, from the field or from the field goal or or from the free throw line. 
um, has to get back, has to defend, has to get a stop, and then has to get a good shot, come back and get a good shot. The original score doesn't count unless you get the stop. Wow, love that. And, and love that. I, I, I think adapting that, so you get all of the reading, you're, yeah. you're practicing your office, you're playing basketball, you know, five on five. Another one I used more, more recently, conditioning five on five, is put the coach on the baseline. This is a great transition drill. Um, stop people, you know, uh, um, not seeing the ball on defense because it's the moment of transition that counts. That's the key, isn't it? When you know Absolutely. you've got the ball. Coach under the, uh, uh, under the basket, offensive play. You don't whistle or call. You just show a silent fist in the air. And the guy with the ball, of course, has got to catch and look. And most often, catch and look. He sees the coach puts his fist up. He just drops the ball. Now, the defense, everybody on the what was the offensive team has to know that the ball is turned over. Turned over but yeah. there hasn't been a turnover as such. So they've now got to recover. Um, yeah, like uh, it. Cover cover back to uh, defense that way you're not blowing a whistle because that doesn't happen in a game no. you know you're not using your voice which doesn't happen in a game i try to go through a practice without a whistle once right found it quite hard but yeah, it's, it it's probably good i do i use that same i use that same uh, drill but um uh instead of them dropping the ball I, they shoot the ball on my on my on my command oh okay same yeah. same, same thing, thing except, so except you, the shot is more obvious um, exactly yeah we're, yeah, we're yeah. dropping it we just literally you don't put it on the floor. No, no, no. Yeah, you literally, yeah. you literally drop it. Good and stuff. this, the one you like, the last one I like is, um, and I've run it a lot towards the, at the end of practice, uh, you know, the consecutive consecutive stops uh, yeah. drill because you know it builds mental toughness. Oh. It, it, you find out who the guys are going to fight are, you know. Chris, um, Chris, Chris try, Finch. Try Chris, Finch Chris Finch loves that. You know, we used to yeah. do everything, you know, three consecutive stops, ball screen defense, regular defense, you know, yeah. situational defense, you know, three consecutive stops. Otherwise, you, you're just staying. So, yeah, it's good you, stuff. You're, you're really, staying on it, yeah. <laughs> really good stuff. Um, All time favorite basketball coach. You can have a couple every, if you want. <laughs> oh, great. Every, well, Every coach that I've tutored, or uh, I'm prepared for this question, every, every coach, coach I've uh, tutored or mentored. Okay. How about that? That's is a, is, a, good, is yeah, that's a great, that's a great. Uh, um, but obviously, uh, Coach Knight, okay. <laughs> Coach Knight, for thinking about the game. I don't like some other things, which we all know about. No, yeah, that's but, right. But, One of the uh, greatest, yeah. I mean, he's the, he's he's he, he built some, he built foundations of our of of the game, which still prevail today. Yeah. You know, it's not even a question. Yeah, winning with less talent and all that. Yeah, absolutely, Coach Knight. Um, go to favorite saying or statement that you used to say all the time. All the time, it's easy to be mediocre. It's easy to be mediocre. Awesome. Great. That's a great way to, to, to end coach. Um, listen, you know, like with over almost everyone, we can, but certainly with you, we could continue, continue talking. Yeah. Uh, yeah but no. It's been pleasurable, um, you know, to talk about, you know, really in depth, you know, points of the game and your view, you know, views, you know, you've had so much success. Um, I just hope that um, there's a way that our country um, and the coaching, the coaches that are in this country can, can take, continue to take the the knowledge and wisdom that you have um and i thank you for being on uh time out coaching podcast appreciate it tony really appreciate you good luck to you this coming year good luck sure.